Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Symposium. I'm so excited to be here. This is one of my favorite weeks of the year, and I really hope you are too. So is everyone excited? Excellent. <laughs> Fantastic. I love it. So our theme this year is human connections in a digital world, and we chose this theme because to us, it really captures what we're trying to achieve when we're building our digital experiences. After all, at the end of the day, we're trying to connect with people when we're building out all of our technology. And of course, the technology is very important. It's absolutely a critical factor. But since our customers are people and they're looking to have experiences from us, I really want to argue today that it's that human connection, that emotion that we're trying to spark that can be so powerful and really take our experiences to the next level. So we all spend a lot of time in our jobs thinking about experience, right? That's why we're all here today. And whether we're on the front lines thinking about the customer or on the back end building the technology, it's something we're thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. And I certainly do in my role as CMO of Sitecore. And so if you take Symposium as just one example, so my team and I have spent really almost a year thinking about this conference, the theme, human connections in a digital world, and what kind of experiences we wanted to create for you this week to go along with that theme. We selected speakers to tell stories. We talked to our partners about what kind of experiences they could provide in the partner pavilion. We thought about imagery, which I think our team did a great job with this year. And we also thought about creating moments, big and small, throughout the conference to really drive that theme home. Like the puppies, which I heard were a big hit last night. <laughs> and so for Sitecore and putting on this conference, the experience you have really matters to us. And today, increasingly, experience matters for a lot of people. In fact, I think you could argue that experience is really the word of the decade. So let's think about why that is. Today, we've got about 4.5 billion people that are digitally connected, and we hear that number a lot. But it's not just people that are connected, things are connected too, and by 2021, there will be about 20 billion things connected to the internet. So that's a huge number. In fact, you can pretty much connect everything to the internet these days. We're connecting our toasters, our Fitbits, our light bulbs, our entire homes are smart enabled. And my recent favorite is a little device called the Smalt, which you can see on the screen behind me. Has anyone heard of the Smalt? Anyone, anyone, I didn't think so. So the Smalt is billed as the world's first interactive centerpiece. And this fabulous little gadget, which I think I definitely need, is a salt shaker. So you can ask it to dispense salt. Hey Alexa, please dispense a tablespoon of salt. It's also a mood light. So you sit it on your table, it creates the mood for your dinner. And finally, the trifecta, it's a Bluetooth speaker as well. So it does, I think, really prove the point that we're connecting anything to the internet these days, and who knows what we're gonna come up with next, right? So with all these people and things that are connected now, the way that we're accessing goods and services, the way that we expect to interact with brands, they've all changed dramatically. And along the way, experience has really become an economy completely unto itself. And if you think about a company like Airbnb, and how their business model started when they were first founded. They were essentially an alternative to a hotel where we could go in and rent an apartment or a house in a neighborhood and try to have an experience like a local. But about three years ago, Airbnb launched this concept of Airbnb experience. And how many of you have done an Airbnb experience? Fair amount of hands. And I've done one myself. Last year, I was fortunate enough to spend Christmas in Rome with my husband, and we booked an Airbnb experience where we went into the home of a Roman family, 
along with about 12 other people from all over the world. And the family fixed us a delicious Christmas feast with traditional Italian dishes. They told us stories about traditions of Italy and Christmas, which are quite different to traditions in the United States. And they served us delicious limoncello that was passed down for generations from their family. And we, we had a camaraderie with the people that were there. And this is an experience that I do not think we would have had if we would have gone into a restaurant. Today, 74% of Americans prioritize experiences over products. And this concept of an experience economy isn't really a new notion. It was first coined by Harvard Business Review back in 1998 and predicted to be a trend in the coming years. And it's taken two decades for that to come to fruition, but it certainly has now. And if you think about millennials and fast forward to today, and you think about this value of experience over things, it's a big shift because starting about after World War II, our economy was trying to recover from the war and it was almost viewed as our civic duty to buy things. We had kitchen appliances coming out, we had cars that we were buying, we had televisions, color televisions, and so purchasing became not only a civic duty, but a symbol of success. And now yet today, if you talk to the millennials, they actually think about things very differently. To them, experience matters a lot more than things. And they cite experiences and relationships as the most important things in life. In fact, 78% of them say they'd rather spend money on experiences than material things. And the data really backs up these choices because studies find that spending money on experiences versus things actually makes people more happy. They get more lasting happiness from the money they spend on the experiences. And so experience really is the new economy. And in this new experience economy, customer experience is quickly becoming the only differentiator that really matters. By the end of 2020 next year, customer experience is expected to overtake price and product as the key brand differentiator. And we know that our expectations around brand experiences have changed as well because of everything happening with the rise of digital. And we think about this as the Amazon effect because now when we buy something on Amazon, we expect it to be delivered certainly by tomorrow, if not within the next hour. So our expectations around how quickly we're gonna receive these purchases have all completely shifted. We expect our brands to know us now and personalize our interactions. We want them to use the data that we provide to tailor the content that we see and the offers that we receive. And so in a very short period of time, customer experience has really moved from a nice to have, be great if we provided a good experience, to a mission critical business differentiator. And as a result of this shift, digital transformation has moved to every company's critical priority list to the point where we're gonna spend about $2 trillion on digital transformation by about 2022, which is just a staggering sum of money. And although digital transformation, and we all know this, is such a top priority, and we all we're here because we realize that technology is a critical component of this, there's always a danger of focusing on just the technology at the expense of the people that are at the center of what we're trying to drive. And we're doing this because we're trying to move quickly. We know that digital experience is a multi-year priority. It's gonna take us a long time to get through the complexity of making the transition, and we wanna move more quickly. How many of you have heard of the term breakpoint? I had not heard of this term either. So breakpoint is a term to describe how customers can get to a point where they're so frustrated with the customer experience that they're just about to take their business elsewhere. So they've gotten to the point where they're thinking, all right, I'm just, I'm gonna go take my business elsewhere. It's called breakpoint. And some companies are actually using 
this breakpoint phenomenon. They're using the technology behind digital experience to figure out right before this point is going to occur and then swoop in with an offer to try to save the customer. Now this is clearly not the digital experience, the customer experiences that we're all trying to build to form connections with our customers. And so Breakpoint illustrates what can happen if we don't put the customer at the center of our digital strategy. And if we don't do that, we really risk the experience going horribly wrong and the customer becoming increasingly frustrated and potentially taking their business elsewhere. And are we putting the customer at the center today? I hear a lot of customer first talk and we all talk about customer first and putting the customer at the center of the strategy, but yet 42% of companies don't ask for any type of feedback from their customers at all. They just don't ask them anything about how they're doing or what they should do better. And customers can sense this disconnect because only 12% of customers believe a company when they say they put the customer first. So what's missing here is that human element. And as a result, brands are potentially missing an opportunity to make a really authentic connection with their customers. And as I've mentioned, we're all people, so we want to have those connections with brands. 62% of customers feel like they're in a relationship with brands that they prefer. A relationship. So as you're sitting out there now, I'm just wondering how many of you are thinking about a brand that you feel like you have a relationship with? And according to the data, it should be 62% of you, but that's a strong word, relationship. And so when I think about that word, I think about Spotify. I feel like I have a relationship with Spotify. I use them every day. I feel like they really know me. They understand my musical taste. They delight me with surprising music that I never would have discovered on my own. So I feel like there is a relationship there. We use the same type of emotional language to talk about brands that we feel loyal to that we use to talk about family and friends and pets. Words like love, adore, happy. I would actually definitely say that I love Spotify, come to think of it. Consumers say that how a brand makes them feel is almost two times more important than any other factor in their buying decisions. So clearly this human or emotional connection has the power to be very powerful. And if we can inspire emotional engagement with our customers, through the experiences that we create, we can inspire action and loyalty and even love as it turns out. So now let's spotlight retail for just a moment. Retail understands the power of emotional connection very well and they always have. And retail can also often be a bellwether for other industries. In fact, retail themselves are set to spend about $100 billion on digital transformation by 2022. So it's a big chunk of that two trillion. And although we all hear the stories about how changing consumer buying preferences are really significantly impacting retail, and we hear a lot about how bad it's been for traditional retail in the past couple of years, still, if you think about it, there are many smart retailers who are taking the understanding that they have of this emotional connection and combining it with digital technology to be able to make human connections and gain advantage as a result. They leverage social channels. They leverage the technology that we have at our disposal now to target and personalize very effectively. And as a result, they're forming connections that are really driving buying behavior. And honestly, many of these are newer brands that probably didn't exist three, four, or five years ago. Some traditional brands are doing it well as too, doing it well also, but these newer brands have kind of come out of nowhere and they suddenly have these very passionate customer bases. And I'm thinking about brands like Away, who make the smart suitcases, or Rothy's. Rothy's is a company that was founded in San Francisco about three, four years ago. They sold a million pairs of shoes in 2018. 
and their customer base is extremely passionate. They've tapped into this combination of leveraging digital technology to target and delivering fantastic content with a mission around sustainability because they make their shoes from recycled plastic bottles to really resonate with their customers. And in addition to brands that are thinking about their approach to digital and human connections in smart ways, many brands are also turning to social media influencers, which is a category or a term that probably didn't even exist as little as five years ago. And social media influencers are masters at human connection, if you think about it. They become an industry unto themselves in a remarkably short period of time and they're driving a lot of efficacy in the marketing mix. 86% of women, 86%, say they rely on influencers to make buying decisions. And 70% of teenagers say they trust influencers more than they trust celebrities, which is a staggering percentage. And in fact, half of consumers rely on influencers to drive their buying decisions. And so we've all seen the stats that people trust peer recommendations a lot more than they trust any other source. And so what social media influencers have done so brilliantly is they've taken this knowledge and they've just run with it. They want to be your peer. They post content every day about their jobs, their family, their dogs, their vacations and you follow them and you see these posts and you start to feel a connection with them. And in every post, there's usually a portion of it that says, oh, if you like what I'm wearing in this vacation photo, you can buy it here. And they're driving a ton of traffic for retailers that are significantly influencing purchases. I have to admit, I follow a few of these people on Instagram, and you do really start to feel like you know them, just like you feel like you know anyone that you're interacting with on social media every day. And clearly they're doing something right, because by 2020, the social influencer industry is going to be $10 billion. And again, this is an industry that simply didn't exist just a few years ago. So this is just one example of how powerful emotional connection can be in driving customer experience. And typically, when we think about customer experience, we think about the physical, the product, we think about the digital, and we think about how are we gonna combine those worlds in seamless ways so that we can create a great customer experience. But I've been arguing about this third element, which is the emotional element, the human connection. And I believe this has the potential to be the most powerful element of, of all. And if we get it right, and we have a successful customer experience, we've got to bridge together all three. And when we do, our customers will be more engaged, more satisfied, and more loyal. So now we're gonna shift the conversation a bit and talk about three ways that human connections can power customer experience. And we're gonna do that by hearing from three Sitecore customers who are successfully connecting all three of these elements. And they're each doing it in very unique ways, very different businesses, but their results are really resonating with customers. So the first way that human connection can power customer experience is to lead with your heart. And there's really no more powerful connection than the human heart. I think we can all agree. So our first customer, American Heart Association, certainly knows a thing or two about hearts. They were founded almost 100 years ago to combat heart disease, which is the leading cause of death for men and women in the United States. And they were founded by cardiologists. They seek to do their work through public education, advocacy, treatment guidelines, and today they're very focused on all of these human elements and how to bring them together with content in powerful ways to try to encourage people to improve their heart health and lead happier lives. 
To hear more about American Heart Association, please join me in welcoming Jason Dyer and Jackie Sebony from AHA. Jackie, Jason, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So I want to start off with kind of a, a segue from the conversation I was just having about emotion and human connection to some of the, the initiatives that American Heart Association has going. Obviously, every company, as I mentioned, is going through digital transformation. And even nonprofits like American Heart Association, you've got maybe slightly different objectives. But at the end of the day, your goal is the same in terms of making that connection with the customer. So can you talk us through your journey and some of your goals for your digital transformation and along the way maybe make that connection to how emotion plays such a critical role? Yeah, so I mean, for us, it's all about engagement fundamentally because um, you know, we're one of the largest science funders in the country and so we don't suffer for content, right? right? That's one of our riches is we have plenty of things to talk about, but our problem was we were publishing all of this stuff, but not paying much attention to was it engaging? Was it drawing people in? Was it interesting? Was the storytelling human? So it was really a switch for us to move from get it published and our job is done to, well, how do we use this content to do something more? And be engaging yeah, with be your Be engaging, customers. yeah, good storytelling, those kinds of things that pull people in. And so how did that take shape, Jackie? Oh, we had a lot of work to do. Um, so one, we really needed to understand what our end users are looking for. Um, we had to change our whole model of designing for and developing content for ourselves and really recognizing what end users really need. And so we really leaned a lot on our, I think a lot of our analytics and um, really dug deeper into like a whole re-concept for our, our web experiences, yeah. Fantastic. Now, Jackie, I'll, I'll ask you this question. I know that you're still relatively early in your personalization strategy, uh, but can you walk us through the approach that you're taking to understand the context that your site visitors are looking for? And I know you've got some interesting challenges in terms of data. That's right. So um, if we think about our end users and all of their different content needs, and if we just look at blood pressure, for example, everybody has a different stage in life when they're um, when, uh, dealing with blood pressure. So if we think about some of our concepts we designed around that, we said, well, we really don't know what stage you are, you're in um, with your blood pressure. So we ask you that, um, considering that that's some of our most trafficked content. So we ask you what stage you're in um, with blood pressure, you new to it, living with it, and then we developed experiences all around those so that we can personalize um, um, all of your content around where you are in your journey. And then if we think about um, holiday time or we think about other experiences where we need to develop more customized content, same thing here, we wanted to understand like where, what's stressing you out? Is it um, during holiday, for example? Is it you know, getting some rest? Is it cooking or, or anything that you, we need to know about you so that we can develop the content around that? So asking what we don't know so that we can build custom content. And then looking to take everyone deeper as they go through and they start to answer more questions, you can then take that data That's and continue exactly right. to build out the experience. That's exactly right, yep. Now, and Jackie, I'll keep the conversation with you here for the next question as well. You guys have been amazingly busy for the last year. They've actually launched five completely unique full websites over the last year, which is, I think as we all know, incredible. It's difficult enough to launch one website. So you've got your flagship heart.org site, you've got the Go Red site, the Stroke Association, CPR and First Aid, which I'll talk more about in a few minutes. So, and, and a couple of others. So let's spotlight Go Red for just a minute. Can you tell us about this fantastic initiative and then walk us through what you were trying to achieve as you built out the site? Perfect, so Go Red, I think our, our site really peaks in February. So during Heart Month, we do a lot of activations and we needed to change that with this new design. We wanted to have all year round experiences and that was really wrapped around getting a woman to make a commitment. And this commitment is, could be to eat better, to be physical, more physically active, to manage her blood pressure. So the first question that we're really trying to get the woman to answer is what do you want to handle? What do you want to take care of? And so we built a whole strategy around 
be whatever she answers. So if it's managed blood pressure, we have a whole customized content experience around that, including um, any whole email strategy. So I think this is our redesign really allowed us to, to rethink the not peak in February, but really all year round, really de design content that helps a woman take more control around her heart health. Yeah, fantastic. And I know there's some great content on there. I've been on there That's myself. Right. Now, Jason, I hesitate to ask what's next because you've been so busy, but I know you have a lot of plans and yeah. you're in particular looking internationally. So can you tell us more about what's on the horizon? Yeah, well, it's not done, right? So we did five sites, but there's just a lot more to do. So we're in so many different places. We have so many different topics that it's the work's not over. So there's more sites to roll out, right? Obviously, international will be another place to go. Um, but there's also then the challenge of how do we take all this data now that we have uh, access to in the new platform and actually extend it into other places. There are other touch points, there are other platforms that we want to integrate with and that's like, that feels so far away given where we've been but that's where we want to go next. So um, it's definitely expanding and continuing to build out but then we're also going to do hopefully, well, I think what everybody does which is continue to optimize the stuff that we've launched because you don't, again, we didn't want to just launch it and walk away. Right. The goal is to continually update and optimize and learn and get better and better and better. Build on that personalization with the data that you're Precisely. Collecting. Yeah, and we've never really done that, so now we're excited to be able to go do that side of using our platform. Fantastic. Well, I'm very excited to also announce here today that Sitecore has selected American Heart Association as our showcase for the event this week. And so we've got a couple of things going on that I think we're pretty excited about. The first is if you go to the Partner Pavilion, you can go through CPR training, and I don't know why everyone wouldn't do this, because you could save someone's life, and it's just a 10-minute training. You can go onto the show floor. They will walk you through it all, and there's even a competitive element to it for those of you who want to compete and see if you can save somebody's life faster than anybody else. You'll be able to do that as you go through the training. And for every symposium attendee that goes through the training, Sitecore is going to donate $25 to the American Heart Association. Thank so you. So please help us out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> but wait, there's more. And so in addition to the CPR training, we've also set up a text to donate. So if anyone just wants to donate directly, we certainly would encourage that. And Jackie, what are the details they text so you? So you can text PSYCOR to 41444. Great, and there's information about that in the Partner Pavilion as well, so you can stop by there. And one more, we wanted to have a fun element, and so if you go uh, to the back, or the, actually the front of where the CPR area is, you'll see two very cool looking cars set up there. And so we've got carpool karaoke set up, and we've got heart theme songs. So all of the songs that you can sing have got heart in the title. You can get your coworkers. I think the car will hold four, five, six people. Go in there, have some fun, record a karaoke song. And then you can share, if you're brave, that song on social media. And so we're actually gonna do a little contest. And in the closing keynote on Thursday, I'm going to award uh, free tickets to next year's symposium to the winners of the best carpool karaoke song. So a little incentive to get you guys going, get your creative juices flowing. So Jackie, Jason, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. <laughs>
loving this music. <laughs> we, let, we let all the customers select their own music, and I think they've done a great job. So thanks so much for joining us. And uh, you know, we all heard in the intro and saw in the video, there's just so much nostalgia that goes into thinking about all of the General Mills brands. And your mission of making food people love when you think about that mission, and I've been talking about the important role emotion plays, you've got this word love right in the mission. And so, Jeff, I'll start with you. Can you, can you talk about what role emotion plays in the connections you're trying to make with your customers? Yeah, General Mills has been a part of, has been making emotional connections around food for over 150 years. Cheerios is often like the first food that parents feed their kids. Yeah. I was in a taxi a couple a month or so ago in Paris, and the taxi driver told me that if I cut him, he would bleed Hagen Dazs ice cream. <laughs> Which is, I mean, it's super powerful. You think it's almost like a sports analogy, right? It's that level of passion. It, it is, but but people are really passionate about our food, and through that passion, we get a lot of feedback from our customers that helps us evolve and makes us so that we can be part of their lives for another 150 years. And so, emotion hugely important, and they're already feeling that emotional connection now. Dale, I'll ask the next question to you. When you think about the mission that you're on from a digital transformation perspective, General Mills has had a long-standing relationship with Sitecore. We've been very fortunate to have you as a customer for over a decade. And so obviously a lot has changed in that time frame from a world perspective and the expectations that our customers have from a technology perspective. How is Sitecore helping you as you evolve in your mission and, and bring that to life through technology? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's a little interesting being a 150-year-old company, and we have to explain to everybody under the age of 20 that we are older than the internet. <laughs> um, so our version of uh, digital transformation is actually seeing digital come to life for our customers and then move on to you know, the present mobile age. And uh, 10 years ago, we started on Sitecore 6 when it was really just a CMS. Uh, and on those two, we, we brought on Pillsbury and Betty Crocker, and those are lovely referred to as our core sites with about 250 million visitors a year. Um, and that let us you know, start to experiment, start to learn about our customers, start to A-B test. Um, but coming along with that is also, when you try and move a site that has tens of thousands of pieces of content, and, millions of, of you know, active users, it takes a long time. So about a year ago, we actually spun up uh, a new team that uh, brought in Sitecore 9, and we started bringing on some of our medium-sized brands, a haagen and Old El Paso, uh, Blue Buffalo, you know, 25 to 40 million. And we started using Sitecore 9, 9.1, hopefully 9.2 soon, uh, and it really brought us a, a whole new set of tools. You know, whether it's the, the personalization, the customer cards, the user journeys through the site, and it's really let us um, start to experiment. And we can do that on the smaller sites and then bring those learnings back to our really big core sites. And the same way when we're with the core sites, we can use that giant set of tools that we have or the, the set of data to do some refinements and share that same information. Back so sharing back and forth. So it's not just the big brands that are, and that all the data you've got there that are informing the smaller brands, but you maybe you've got a little bit more freedom with some of the smaller brands to take some risks and then apply those learnings over to the big brands. Yeah, the, the risk of, of trying something that's a, a little farther out there on one of the smaller brands is significantly lower than going all the way up to Pillsbury or Betty. And, and so, Jeff, back over to you with this next question. When we think about, and you know, Dale's talking about the differences between some of the, the larger brands and, and then the more medium-sized brands. You've got several brands like Blue Buffalo that are building out their experiences now, obviously very different than a haagen or an Ode El Paso. How do you approach learning about what kind of experiences the customers of these different brands want to see from you and gain that understanding of how they're looking for you to really fit into their daily lives, which I know is important to you. It, it is very important. We do a significant data analysis about, of our sites and our users and traffic across the globe. So we have over 300 brand sites globally, and we spend a lot of time looking at how our consumers are using those sites, what type of information they're looking for, the types of devices that they're using, the times of day that they're interacting with us. And you know, while a Blue Buffalo is, is a different business than like a Betty Crocker, which is different than like an Old El Paso, when it comes down to it, people are looking for information out about our products. They're looking for 
uh, information about those brands, and um, and we can take learnings from some of our uh, from our other sites. And we do a significant amount of testing on our platforms that generate over 100 million visits a year. And we take those learnings and we roll them out to our smaller brands. And so, what types of learnings are you seeing? And I know we talked a little bit about mobile and how a lot of times when brands are interacting with you, they're doing so in the grocery store or in their kitchen. Talk about what some of the expectations are that they have in those moments and how you're mapping to those. Yeah, so for, for our mobile consumers, which is over 80% of our traffic, they're lo our, those people are looking for very fast experiences. They're looking uh, for an information architecture that's easy to navigate and provides them with the information that they're looking for. And my personal favorite that you mentioned yesterday is the thing that you're about to roll out with regard to recipes in the kitchen. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, when, you know, when, when people are cooking on their, their mobile phones on BettyCrocker.com or Pillsbury, you know, your phone turns off you know, and it goes dark on you and Very you have annoying. to like open it, you know, unlock it with your nose or something because your hands are... Dozens of times. Yeah, your hands are covered in stuff. So. Um, <laughs> You, you know, we, we took that feedback from our consumers and we saw that frustration in the need state and are implementing just a, a simple button that you can click to keep your phone awake. It's going to save a lot of uh, smudges on the device screen for sure. Yes. <laughs> so Dale, back over to you for, the, for this last question. You've, you, you've, you've come a long way and you, you've talked already about kind of the evolution of the technology and the evolution of your relationship with Sitecore. But I know that from your viewpoint, you still think that you're kind of at the beginning of your journey, although I think you're pretty far along. <laughs> Talk about how you're thinking about what's next and how you're going to unify the experience really across all the brands, which I know is one of the milestones you're looking at. Yeah, I think that's probably our biggest challenge at the moment. Uh, we affectionately say that our org chart is part of our installation. <laughs> and, uh, our individual brands tend to uh, have their own implementations, their own marketing, their own data, and it becomes just a huge challenge to try and mash that all up into some format that we can then learn from uh, across all our brands in the aggregate. Um, but with the new Sitecore 9 installation we've got up, what we're starting to do is actually track our users across our sites. Um, and why we think that's a big opportunity for us is I like to use the metaphor of the shopping cart, which is probably why there's that stock photo up. Uh, our users don't buy one product at a time. They take their shopping cart and they fill it with all the food they need for the week. And you know, if we're very fortunate, there's a whole bunch of General Mills brands in there. But it probably speaks to their need state. If you have a young kid, maybe you're buying Cheerios for their first food. If you're trying to uh, eat healthier, maybe you're trying some of our heart healthy conscious stuff, or maybe you're trying to be gluten free. And we need to understand, not just on an individual product, but the larger picture of what they're looking for and find a way to connect with them and cater and personalize our communication to their need state. And what we're really excited about is we feel like the data that we're learning digitally can then actually feed back into our product innovation in the company so we can identify those missing links in our consumers' lives and try and be the ones that fill them. It'll be an amazing accomplishment as you move forward to be able to think about it from a lifestyle perspective and then applying all the brands across that lifestyle. So I'll look forward to tracking the progress on that. Dale, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And before we uh, leave GM, I also want to share that uh, General Mills has been generous enough to donate some snacks. So when you leave the auditorium at the break in a little bit, you'll be able to have a, a Lara bar or a Nature Valley granola bar. So thank you to General Mills for providing those to the audience so you can sample some of the food that people love. And so now, last but certainly not least, the third way that human connection can power customer experience is to inspire the physical with the digital. And our next customer's entire business, really, is to create experiences that inspire a sense of awe and wonderment. And I have to say, they do a pretty amazing job at it. To tell us more about how Cirque du Soleil inspires the physical with the digital, Please join me in welcoming Pierre Paul Lariviere. Hey. Good morning, Paige. Hello. Good morning, everyone. 
Do you want to sit down? Uh, maybe before we sit down, why don't we just warm up a little bit? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, um, I thought about, I'm going to teach you something. Okay. You know, something that you can... You're taking, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Taking, oh, yeah, sure, I do. Oh, something that you can potentially leverage uh, during your next garden party just to impress your friends. Okay, I'm ready, I'm ready. Yeah. So I'm going to teach you how to do the perfect backflip. Uh <laughs> Easy. No. Techniques. It's all about technique, right? Okay. Okay, first. Have you signed a legal waiver? Because our, our chief legal counsel's in the front row here, uh, and he's probably sweating already. <laughs> was it written like in little caps, character? Like? It was, it was. Oh, yeah, yeah I yeah, did. Yeah, okay. okay, all good. So, but there's a, I think it's, it looks comfortable here. Am I, am I doing this? Uh, with these, <laughs> I wouldn't try, you know? But, but you can try it after that. Okay, you know? okay. Okay, so first, you have to... So you breathe, right? Important, like it's all in the breathing. It's Super relaxed. There's like 10,000 people here. We're, we're really relaxed. <sighs> okay. Okay. And then it's about the toes. Okay. So you have to like have a 12 to 15 angle in, in your toes. <laughs> okay. And the pressure will be on your toes. Okay. Because actually you don't want to do a front flip, right? It's a back flip you want to do. Okay. You bend your knees, comfortable. You look behind. You don't want to injure anyone, right? So, oh, there's something missing. Uh, or maybe drum roll. Drum roll, please. Okay. Okay? Okay, I'm just gonna watch. Okay, one, two. Come on, guys. I'm a marketer, not an acrobat. Please. Let's... You wanna sit down now? Yes, I wanna sit down okay. now. But you see, this micro moment we've created together was meant somehow <laughs> <laughs> to establish a connection. Right. A connection at, at the human level. Connection to my beating heart that exactly. you were actually going to do that. At the sure. human level, yeah. right? <laughs> and as I'm from Cirque du Soleil, and I'm, I think I'm fairly in shape, right? I led you to think that I would do a backflip. That would be the personalization part. I was of, about to believe I could act. do a backflip. Exactly. So it's like about showing my brand DNA somehow. Right. And after all that, in a week or a month from now, you'll probably won't even remember what I said, not even remember potentially what I did, but something you'll remember. It's, it's the emotion it, it generated to you. And emotion, that's the key ingredient we want to leverage in our digital experiences. At and, and that's really what Cirque is all about, right? And I, and I know that you know, you've always had a big focus on emotion in the shows and yeah. you know many of us have been to Cirque shows we all know this but I think the thing that we want to talk about today is some of the shifts that have happened over the last couple of years and you know, you're on the front lines of this in your role yeah. is in going from thinking about the show and being more product centric to really shifting your focus to think about and you call them the fan and so to be fan centric so tell us about that shift and why it was so important well we're um you know, we're part of the, the Markham uh, department, uh, and, and along with uh, PR, uh, brands, uh, studio, uh, digital media production, social media, um, the dev team, well, uh, we do have like the strat product and dev team part of this mm. department as well, and, and traditionally, uh, we were doing marketing against the product itself, you know, the show, mm -hmm. leveraging the key elements of the show, such as, um, costume, music, uh, uh, you know, acrobatic a act, and all that stuff, which is genuinely the ingredient of a show. When you shift toward a more customer-centric approach, uh, as we like to say, fan-centric mm -hmm. approach at Cirque, then it's, 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 it's a shift where we're looking not, well, we're, we're using the lens of the, of the consumer, right? to look at the emotion that our show generates. And that's the shift that we're doing. These emotion, we're leveraging them and feeding our decision-making process to create the perfect, the perfect uh, digital experience or, or user experience. Because actually, I do think at the end, the best user experience, it's the one that you don't even feel that is, 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 is orchestrated around you, right? But it leaves you with a little je ne sais quoi, right? Je ne sais quoi. Je ne sais quoi but very positive relation with the brand. 
And, and I think this ties into the next question about, as you think about all of this and building out these fan-centric experiences versus so much focus on the product, you've, you've mentioned that you think that to take advantage of the way that people are really expecting to communicate with brands, that you're looking to level up, I think that's your term, the, the Cirque du Soleil yeah. experience. And I know that relates very directly to this shift from product-centric to fan-centric. So talk about what you mean by that and how you're accomplishing it. You've got a lot going on in that regard. You know, those digital people and marketing people were a little bit crazy. So we gave ourselves a goal, <laughs> maybe too ambitious, uh, you know, we have a lot of show around the world and, and the quality of our show is like there. The so our, our, nice. our fan are expecting as well the experience and, and the, the, the buying experience to be at that level. Mm -hmm. Match it with the idea that uh, our, the consumer evolving in, in their ways of, of, of communicating with the brand, in their behavior. Uh, they do connect through voice user interface. Uh, conversational marketing is, is on the rise. Intent marketing is the new, is the new trend, which, which brings us to create totally new type of content, written content, and also new channel to distribute this content. And you weren't really doing that before, right? You were focused on the show. Yeah. So the experience was taking place at the show, and that was really it, right? And so you exactly. discovered this, this disconnect. It's totally disconnect. So we had to rethink the way that, that we're marketing our show. And, and we also found out that like branded terms like Cirque Show Vegas went down in search, in traditional search engine, right? So we had to, to to think about, well, if they don't search with those terms, where do they, How will they find search us? for us? Yeah. yeah. So a bunch of new channel came up, like TikTok, Instagram, whatever, and what's the next trend? So we shifted again our way to, to, to present our show or to feed the search engine. So it's not anymore about Cirque Show Vegas. It's more about uh, going out with my family, exciting show in Vegas. So we have to feed content that will answer those queries. You know, it's pretty interesting too, because if you think about you know, what I talked about at the, as I kicked off the, the conversation earlier, was the fact that experience is the new economy. Yeah. And it's even changing the way people are searching for what they're gonna do. They're searching for experience type terms versus the specificity of Cirque in Vegas. Totally. And it changes your entire marketing approach. Totally, totally, totally. So what steps have you taken as you've learned all of this to integrate the virtual and the physical? <laughs> steps. Uh, the first one was a step back, right? Um, and it's okay sometimes just to take a step back and look holistically at what you're doing. So. Uh, we started by remapping or re-evaluating uh, the journey of our users, right? And I would, I, I'd like to think about the journeys, because as they're coming from different entry points, uh, digital ads, email marketing, uh, social media posts, and all those entry points, so the journey may be different, right? Um, through that mapping, we just identified the blind spots, right? And we found out that we were super good at throwing advertisement out there, digital ads, bringing people through the, 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 the buying funnel, right? But from the moment they got a ticket in hand until the show happened, well, a week or a month or a few months uh, may happen, right? And, and we were not there. We were not with our user at that point. They were waiting. They were kind of We're waiting not, and yeah. waiting for what? Like maybe waiting for us just to continue the, the experience with them until the show and beyond the show. Uh, which brought us to fill that blind spot with mobile ticketing, which opened a channel uh, through uh, uh, the mobile device. And then like pick up with like, why not a chatbot? So you buy a ticket, you're prompt to connect with the chatbot. You can, you can then interact with the brand and asking question about content, about how to get there. Can I pay cash? All the question that a, that a fan would ask before getting to a show. 
then in venue, why not adding some AR experiences, a kind of scavenger hunt where you're looking for clues, some AR animation are popping out, and then uh, you share it on, on social network. We pick up the shared uh, content from our fans in venue and then aggregate it, push it on digital screens so they feel they're the star of the evening. So that's kind of our 360 experience version, even if like social media team would say, well, 180 is the new 360, <laughs> but it's our 180 360 experience that we're creating. 180 is the new 360. Yeah, because actually, you know why? Why? They said, <laughs> it's impossible to, to see 360, mm -hmm. so it's, it's 180, but you may turn your head to get the 360, right? <laughs> you know those social people? <laughs> they, they're like marketing people. <laughs> <laughs> so it, when you and, and you, you there's a big tie through I hear I think between this last answer and this next question because you've clearly thought about it from the fan perspective and I, I know that you have an interesting perspective on the digital trend in general which maps to what we've been talking about that it's really more about the people than the technology and of course the technology is the enabler yeah. so talk about how you have been able to transform to create that value by putting the people at the center. Yeah, um, interesting because um, I, I uh, sometimes I do refer to technology and sorry guys and, and sorry sidecore but <laughs> analogy here I, I often refer technology as like duct tape and tie wrap. It's super efficient, right? Uh, and, and it's something that evolves anyway. It can do the job now and it, it's gonna change anyway and it does the job. But for me, like digital transformation, it's, it's, it's not about technology. Technology will always and ever evolve and, and expand and give us a new opportunity. Um, the transformation, and if I can refer like to a personal story, like five years ago, I started a journey where I wanted to lose weight. I was 35 pounds more, right? So I got into this, this training thing for three, four, five times a week. Didn't lose any weight. Gaining muscular, yeah, muscle, but not losing weight. The thing is, I changed my mindset, right? But not the ingredients. The intake was the same. So I got on the keto diet, no promo here, but <laughs> it worked. So you've gone through your own digital transformation. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. So I think it's the same thing for, for digital transformation in, in a group. You know, we have to change the mindset of the people, but not just the mindset. If, they, if we change the mindset, but they're using the same tool, we'll end up with the same result. So change the mindset, change the tool, and afterward do education, education, education. Yeah. We have to educate people. And the last ingredient, I would say, to succeed in, in the digital transformation, it's the empowerment. So be generous. Open your CMS to your marketing teams, to your brand manager. Let them get into the CMS. Let them update content. And let them see that behind every action that you're doing, as we're digital and it's measurable, there's an interaction from the consumer. That's what I think would be a successful digital transformation. I agree. I think that people element is so important. I, I don't know that I would equate the technology to duct tape, but <laughs> I, I agree that the people are much more important. But so, I, you know, like, I love you guys, huh? <laughs> Even if very sophisticated duct tape. Duct yeah, tape very and sophisticated yeah, yeah. duct tape. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, Pierre Paul, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. We, I think we've all really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye <laughs> bye. Okay, so we've come to the end of our time together, and along the way, we've taken a look at three ways that human connections can power customer experience. And so hopefully these three fantastic customers who are all very unique have shown us all the power that comes when you really bring in that emotional connection into the experience. So thank you all so much, and I hope to see many of you throughout the week. Have a great symposium.